Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Modern SaaS Podcast. Today I have a special guest, Sujan Patel, founder and CEO at Mailship. Sujan, welcome to the pod. Thank you for having me. Excited to chat with you. Sujan, you may not know this. I have been following your journey for almost now probably eight, nine years ago. I was probably one of the MailCheck's earliest customers at my previous startup. And for all the audience, if you don't know what MailCheck is, it's one of the simplest sales engagement platform. And now they do a lot more than that. Improve your deliverability or all your outbound efforts. So if you're in the market considering to improve your reply rates and outbound delivery, definitely you should consider MailCheck. But I'm not here to pitch MailCheck, <laughs> I just wanted to tell you that. Definitely followed your journey a very long time and was excited when we earned MailCheck as a customer here at Avoma. So thank you for your support business and inspiring many SaaS founders like me because uh, you have been in the SaaS business for longer than most of us are here. Well, thank you, man. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to, to connect and build a relationship over the last few weeks. And hopefully all the content or the journey has helped <laughs> pave the way forward for other other SaaS entrepreneurs. I feel like a generation has changed and I didn't get the memo. <laughs> I just got gray hair along the way. I remember like I, I've been following like other folks' journeys from like the early, early, early SaaS days when like SaaS yeah. Cloud came out. And then like they're like, oh, a generation change. And I was like Gen 2. Now it's I think we're in Gen 3 SaaS. And it's changing super fast than what the, the standard duration of how long the generation lasts. That's also changing really, really fast. Absolutely. I think it's going to keep going. Gen 4 is going to be here tomorrow, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this is a good segue, Sujan, to talk about it because things are changing so much. The way I understand MailCheck operates in what kind of category, the sales engagement and email engagement space. And now if I think about Avoma, how we are operating and what's happening in our market, the conversation intelligence market, we do see these markets are becoming a lot more competitive. Combination of we already have your the older kind of uh, high-end startup competitors, incumbent competitors. Then there are the newer ones, the smaller end of the ones are also coming in. And plus you see these uh, people who used to be your partners like CRM providers, now they're also becoming to some extent your competitors. So you're partners, friends are becoming to some extent enemies. So there's this new frenemy thing also. So you're trying to protect from every single direction, every single angle. You have been operating in this space longer than I have. So I would love to understand both as a founder, how you think about operating in a competitive kind of industry, both from mindset point of view, strategy point of view, also from an execution point of view. Yeah. So I think what's changed. So the reason there's more competition real quick is that it's easier than ever to build technology and there's a lot more APIs and platforms out there mm. that support building quickly. So like open air exists. So like, look, everybody can build, they're called prompt engineers, right? Like it's just a series of sophisticated questions and then like filters. My point is everybody can say a AI on their, on their thing and they probably have it. The question is, is it any good? Right? Like, so first, whatever your value prop is today, I think m now more than ever, you have to be looking at that quarterly or every six months right. to at least annually to make sure it's up to date. Trust me, we made that mistake 18 months ago. Our value prop was very different. We woke up a month ago, like, whoa, this, what happened? Why does not like, it's just like that value prop is no longer competitive in the market because the market changed. So selling, I think one, selling in a competitive market requires one or and, and advertising competing in general means you have to be, you have to be very realistic of where, what do you stand out in? And you got to get the whole company behind that. Meaning sales, the messaging on the marketing end, the product has to be Excel in whatever area, right? Again, like two years ago, if you had AI, you would be the leader yeah. in whatever, even if it's competitive space. Today, if you don't have AI, you're left, you're the lowest hanging, like the worst in the space, mm -hmm. right? And if you have AI now, it's not a differentiator. It's just there because the market's saturated with stuff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the novelty 
has worn off a lot. And I think you'll see that more coming up. But my point with the competitive market is every market is competitive because it's easier than ever. Yeah. The way I look at this is if you want to build a business, yeah. you have to think about what kind of business you want to build. You have to now accept you're going to lose certain areas. Yeah. So for example, my North Star is at Mailshake where Bootstrap, I want to get to a $100 million exit value. Yeah. That is my guiding principle for all decisions. We do a, an independent valuation. We keep an eye on the market conditions of buyers. We know who strategic buyers are. Dang. We know, like we know our exit paths and it's either strategic or PE. Now I'm not saying we have to sell, but that's my like, that's how I make money in the long term, right? Well, you might be different. You might, if you're funded, your journey is somewhere else. If you're bootstrapping, you're like, you know what? We're just going to be super high profit, right? Well, there are companies in our space that their business strategy is like grow fast, low cost, right? Product excellence, not a factor but they're making $2 million a year. And I'm like, I will make $0 a year so I can make $100 million in five years or 10 years. Hopefully that works. We'll see. But my point is, when you have the guiding principle, you work backwards from that. that, that, that. So for us, we are like, well, you know what? We know from our valuations and being realistic about what our company's worth, what customers help us have exit value. So what that means is, over the last two years, we've unfortunately ditch the bottom end it's not that we're not keeping the customers we have or we don't have features for them but we effectively had to price them out because those customers from an exit value are worth nothing and so my north star is exit value and they're worth nothing what does that mean <laughs> right so but uh, so we're losing and, and it sucks i hate losing right especially when you have competitors from the side the top and the bottom so the top is People that are more expensive, sides are your frenemies, your integration partners, the hub spots of the world or whatever. And the bottom is usually I find this like companies in kind of lower costs, they currency down and it's like cheaper countries to build product in. And they just like, you know what? We're just going to take a zero off the price. We don't care. Right. So there's a race to the bottom. If you're going to play in that space, price is your competition value. How do you have them? Most value. For me, I'm playing the quadrant above. So I'm actually playing in the quadrant of I am so cheap and high value against my biggest, com bigger competitors, but I'm more expensive than these people. And therefore, I'm losing those customers. Again, you just got to figure out your market. Your sales team have to know what the competition offer and they have to have a battle card. This is like sales 101. Mm -hmm. But the difference is what's the battle card? Okay, the battle card is on the lower end. Yeah, we are more expensive. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, blah. Okay. On the upper end, yeah, we don't have as many features. Typically, this is the same argument. But we're going to beat them on price. And you know what? People don't use those features. Mm -hmm. On the other, the platforms, I think the platforms on the sides are the easiest to beat because they're just mediocre products, right? But, but again... You got to know where your strategy is. HubSpot's strategy is amazing. Their strategy, from my understanding, is they're going to just build a B- minus product, but they're going to have a lot. Mm -hmm. And the reason that works out for them is financially, when they when a user or customer subscribes to three or more products, mm -hmm. they keep them for, forever and the NRR goes up. Mm -hmm. So they're like, if I build one more product, who cares? I just make more money. Yeah. As a founder, I can't do who cares. I love product excellence. It's a meaning like, what I want to build, it has to be valuable, good. And you have, you have to be proud about what you build, so definitely understand that. I think this is a lot of great insights here, the way you said, starting from the North Star, once you know what kind of company you're building, all the decisions, the prioritization, the strategy, the clarity comes based on that. Like I love the way you articulated the battle cards, competitive battle cards are going to be different based on who is in front of you. And who are they evaluating against you? And so there are customers who are going to want you to compare with the lower end. Some are going to compare with the higher end. Some are going to compare with the side end. And literally that level of training and execution is required. And the reason I was asking, it's one thing to have strategy that here we are different, but then it has this ripple effect. That strategy gets into every single thing, the messaging on the website, what kind of pricing you decide, packaging you do. 
the training for salespeople and execution wise. And this is another thing compared to most of the audience for us is always salespeople. And so one of the things I would love to go deeper into that, you talked about the battle cards and what else, how salespeople need to evolve, what they need to do. And it's not just the markets are competitive. Now we are also in 2023 and 2024. They're even more brutal where cost is definitely a factor. More importantly, the value, the ROI, the, the days are gone in 2022 to 21 where everyone was buying anything and you had to take an order and just facilitate that. Now it's not easy. So what have you seen in these markets and in plus competitive market? What ch strategies are changed? How the execution has changed when you're working with the frontline salespeople? Yeah, absolutely. So the change is buyers were buying for three years straight. They're flush with cash, whether either funding, profit from their growth, right? It's a ripple effect, right? If you're in B2B, yeah. you are selling to B2B. They're, if they're making money, you're making money, more money, right? And it's all growing. But when that, when that starts shrinking, you start... Anyways, my point is, it's not buyers are buying market anymore. It's sellers have to sell, okay? And, and every... I'd say 12 months to maybe 36 months, there's a theme. It mm. happens in the world all the time, okay? Right now, there's two themes going on, efficiency and price, cost cutting and, and, and budget consciousness, right? So like every company, every CFO is drilled in, where are we spending money? Is there a return on this? I can tell you that three years prior, the CFO was like, Buy it so you can get the sales. We can get the market while it's up. Now, that's the right strategy. When buyers are buying, your job is to show up, right? That's it. You just got to show up and play the game. When the, when the market's contracting, which is what's happening now, you have to really sell. Well, and that means is your value prop going back to the competitive market. It's the same thing. You have to understand where you provide value. And I say efficiency now, that's where I think AI comes in. There's a novelty factor of AI, but there's also the efficiency of AI. So like quick example of Velma and how we use it, I can quickly audit things of my whole team. Implementing coaching is faster. And what that means is my team, it can increase their close rate at a more rapid rate. So time is money, right? At the end of the day. So yeah, so the way the current market is, and there's always themes, It'll change next year. You gotta just look, keep a keep a pulse on what's going on. Today, there's two big things every every company, B two B SaaS company, needs to worry about. How can you produce better ROI than anyone else in this space? How can you increase the ROI? Right. And number two, because there's a comp it's been a competitive market and it's continuing to get more competitive. You're getting cut more, more and more customers are coming through the door that are already using a technology for whatever you do. So you have to, be, there has to be a reason to switch. And another way to look at this is you got, how do you make switching easy? Can I um, export everything from like what we've got at Mailshake is we, we don't have an export tool, but we've got, we've got like low level kind of low cost VA type folks to like, Hey, you want to switch your campaigns? Let me help you. I'm going to just do it for you, right? Because sales engagement platforms in our space, I'll be dead honest. Switching is have, provides very little benefit, right? Like unless you're missing something, or like switching from outreach to Mailshake. If you're gonna, if you want to save ten thousand dollars a year or more, great, switch, right? That's a cost benefit. Goes back to number one. But if you're like, I want better productivity that's a workflow change. It's not usually justify the one to two months transition, right? So my job, I'm like, how do I make switching more compelling, right? And the only thing I can think of is, is like better deliverability, better economics, right? Stuff like that. So I'm that's where my head's at. If you're a sales rep or you're a founder or a marketer, don't hide all this stuff embrace it we are better because of blah and you don't need six bullet points or three bullet points you need one right and that's just got to be really good and again test right so you know what we do right now is we're like i'd say we're a nine out of ten in it services but a five out of ten in some other categories so it goes back to like laser focusing on markets where we're 
where we can be excellent in. And so in a competitive market, in the current market, it's also about narrowing down various channels or paths of who your ICP is. And, and this might not be a forever thing and it's a moving target. And then testing out messaging. So like, for example, I just rattle out, like we're cheaper than outreach. Okay, great. I, that's what I believe. That's what I know. That's what I believe a customer would care about. What I do is I test my sales pitch and do marketing and advertising. So we'll do Facebook ads, LinkedIn ads, email copy, headline copy. And essentially we're testing to see if that resonates with the person. And I use this other tool called Winter, W-Y-N-T-E-R, run by Pep Laja, more like he's an ex-CRO, but, well, he's still a CRO, but conversion rate optimization, not chief revenue officer. But he has a B2B like messaging feedback platform. So I'll run the messaging through his like his audience and be like, hey, I want this to be seen by VP of sales or the CFO or blah, 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 whoever I think my ICP is. And I want to say like, I want them to give me critique on this messaging. And I can tell you, I ran this like a month or two ago. I had this amazing two or three pitches and for different segments. And I thought they were amazing, first of all. My team thought they were amazing. They actually worked well on the website. But when we pitched them against the buyer, uh, so from marketing, it worked <laughs> on the website. It got people reeled in. But when we pitched it to like the buyer, which would be a VP or director of sales and the CFO sign offs, they're like, so what? This is not, how is this different than anything else out there? I'm like, oh crap. So I've got a good marketing message. <laughs> it resonates and gets people in, but I've got a generic sales message. So get that feedback, right? And so I, I urge people to do like, to do surveys, studies, testing on their stuff and do that often because the market's changing so, not necessarily so fast, but it's just changing with more competition coming in and then buyer demand going down. Your value prop might be shitty in three months. You don't know. I No one can tell you. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is brilliant. Both the tactical advice, how do you test the messaging on the website and just don't settle on the messaging, on the marketing messaging. There is also as the messaging continues throughout the customer journey. The narrative selling continues to happen throughout the now the sales process itself. And you said something interesting earlier on. You said that buyers were buying. Now sellers have to sell. And on all the things that you share, definitely the, the strategy, the messaging is one area where we will train salespeople, they would understand about specific industry, about specific product, and they can start comparing. But have you seen in this market then the sales reps have to do anything else in terms of rescaling themselves just based on how competitive it is? And is it enough for them? Do they have to go and retrain, re-coach themselves about all the things that you're seeing? Because it seems like it's a lot more difficult where the that level of understanding that it, on one hand, the modern buyer also has evolved and you you want sales reps to sell. That means we, on one hand, you're saying that, okay, let's be aggressive in selling. And then we don't want to go to that level where it's a car salesman and more the pushy salesperson as well, right? Then cars are going to, again, have a kind of repulsive effect for that. So how should salespeople kind of evolve into this modern selling world? Like what's happening there? Number one, build a personal brand, right? Founders should have a personal brand that's like default, right? But now your team has to have a personal brand. So if your customer's on LinkedIn, if you're selling a B2B, be on LinkedIn, post, go, you know, and, and if you're the company, the CEO listening here, or the sales, heads of sales, invest in your team to learn about copywriting. Like we bought Justin Welsh's course on LinkedIn, spent like six months training all of our reps. Like at the beginning, we had to feed them all this stuff. And then also on the marketing front, we've got all this content collateral. We feed them all the content. They choose what they want to write. It's their words or whatever, but we we train them. So that's something you as a company can do. But sales rep need to have a personal brand in some area, shape, or form. And the reason why is it, it differentiates you. Selling is still two humans. That's not going to change. It's still two humans making a decision, right? If I... Talk, if there's 100 companies in the space, 50 of them or 20 of them meet my 
punch list of a criteria from what I can gather if I'm the buyer. I talk to 20, maybe 10 of them have the pricing. The person who stands out the most is the person I build a relationship with and I trust the best. So number one, build a brand because you can become instantly more trusting. Number two, become an expert. Like, so our salespeople are like cold email and deliverability experts. Why? Because they need, that's what the customer is asking. They're not like, do you have this feature? No, it's like, hey, I'm doing, I'm sending this many emails. Here's my campaigns. Here's actually, uh, here's what, here's my copy. And the, the, the rep's like, actually, I think you should, might want to be doing it this way. Here's how we train. Let me ping our CS person and blah, blah, blah. Right. Anyways, my point is become an expert, right? That's, that's another thing. And then the third thing is really around the one who's the most aggressive and provides the most value regardless of the sale is the one ultimately who's going to win the deal. Remember, just because you lost the deal, just because it's a no today doesn't mean it's a no six months from now, 12 months from now. Lost deals, those are something it used to be, okay, they're lost. Now it's like follow up in 12 months or six months, right? Like lost for competitor or just like you know, budget or whatever the reason. So it's all about follow-ups and being aggressive, you know, without being schemy. And what is aggressive? So like what the difference between a used car salesman's approach and aggressive follow-up with value is value. Okay. So if I email you and I text you every day and I'm like, hey, come on my podcast, come on my podcast, come on my podcast. A used car salesman usually says the same thing, right? Oh, you know what? I just got this person on my podcast, blah, blah, blah. But if I'm like, hey, I read your article. I just saw your latest podcast on this. Kit, I really want to talk to you about this. My audience of blah, blah, blah. The next follow up might be like, hey, we just published this podcast and it got like 50,000 views. Do you want 50,000 views? My point is, I have to first understand the value that you're seeking and then I have to figure out how to provide it. The difference between follow up that's annoying and that's helpful is some sort of value. This is amazing. So, if I want to summarize what sellers are, pretty much I would say any customer facing function, go to market function, could be salesperson, could be customer success. What you're suggesting, obviously, build your brand. On LinkedIn, have your personal brand. People are going to buy from you because they're going to trust you. So, I, I love that advice. The second thing also, the last thing you also mentioned about the whole, uh, the follow-ups, but aggressive follow-ups, but with value. Aggressive follow-ups without any value. When you start thinking about what's in it for me, then it's not going to be valuable for them. The, the moment you think about what's in it for them, that's when you're providing more value. Exactly. And obviously, I think this is, and then the process in general, how they follow the follow-ups, and this is this is brilliant. So, Sujan, we, we talked about what they should do. There's also the element, what should they stop doing it? Because the piles also have changed. Do you see any practices today people still do, either salespeople, customer success people, following the traditional old practices and they haven't evolved yet? What would you advise them that stop doing these things? This is not where the buyers are today. Well, here's here's what I think. And this is not a, I don't mean to be a sales pick for, for a Velma, but Go it, go listen to your calls. So before or you should continue, I don't know. Like I could tell you the three generic things that people need to stop doing. But the reality is the information is in your demos, is in your communication already. Go find out. Look, there, there's no doubt that leads are lower right now for most places, for most companies. And it's Q4, flow time. Go spend the week between Christmas and New Year's learning about what you do well and what you suck at, okay? Everyone sucks at stuff. Like I suck at a lot of things. I just may not be aware of what I do. I'm not good at. Just go get better at what you do. Go listen to your calls. Go, are you saying um too much? Uh, another thing is, are you talking too much? Are you, do you understand, and this might be where you need others to kind of look at your content. Do you understand what the customer is asking or really wants, go back and audit your demos. Like if you're a sales manager, go dig into all your demos. Do this regular, like twice a week with your team. 
like the Avoma part, it just saves you a bunch of time, like skimming through stuff. Like I would just go like first five minutes of everything. And I'm like, are you asking the customer what they really want to get out of this? Or are you just going them, are you just driving them down? Like what features they want? Because like, if I told you, Hey, I'm looking for a conversational intelligence tool. These are the seven features I want. Do you have them? Yeah. Let's go down one by one. Yeah. Versus you could say, Hey, Sujin, what do you want to achieve with this? Like, yeah. do you want more close rate? Cause I can tell you like, here's the things we can do to help with the close rate. So sometimes it's the buyer driving it. Sometimes whatever. Anyways, long story short, you're make everyone's making mistakes. And generally mistakes are not understanding what the buyer wants and driving the conversation in the right direction from the beginning or two, maybe you just need to change your process yeah. completely. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I was not expecting, obviously, a shout out to Haboma. So thank you very much. Um, I'm glad that you found it valuable and you have been supporting us and thank you for business. But I think uh, one of the things Mailshake was phenomenal in compared to a lot of our customers that I had seen was that you had this definitely very aggressive coaching culture. And uh, people, when I, when I used to talk to sales leaders, they would say, well, we listen to once in a while. And uh, especially, you know, our competitor, Gong, VP of sales would always say that, oh, I love Gong. And I would say, why do you love Gong? Well, I can go back and listen to the calls. And I, I would ask, how often do you listen? Oh, once in a while. And then I would realize that, well, sure, you listen once in a while. And then the cost and the, it's, it's basically an expensive call recording that it becomes. Someone like Mailshake, the culture was very different. You almost had this daily call reviews with the team. And there are a lot of companies who think that, oh, the I've deployed this conversation intelligence AI tool and it's going to solve all my problem. I don't have to sit to the call <laughs> yeah. as a manager. That's it. Didn't I buy you guys just for so that you can solve all the coaching problems? Yeah. And give to educate them that look, there is a maturity curve. And you AI is gonna help you identify the problem. It's not gonna resolve all the problem. So you still have to use yeah. the time. And I'll personally learn a lot from Mailshake's coaching culture that you have. There is a there is a balance between, you know, being, you know, a lot of salespeople like, oh, I don't want this. A Brick Brother monitoring effect, people are watching me and they're critiquing me. Mm-hmm. And you know, humans always have a habit of talking about how do you constructive criticism, as we say, get better. And uh, how was that culture evolved? And uh, how would you advise if somebody's not doing that today and they have this mindset that I don't want to listen to the call, it takes too much time. What's your advice or guidance to them? How to they start? Okay, so my count, okay, this, this is a great question. I have a really fun, like a funny story. And it starts with me being cheap. Okay. <laughs> or maybe bootstrap and not having the money. Sure. But let me, let me, let me answer this. Uh, th- there's a couple analogies here. One is if you're sales head of sales and you're not listening to your calls, what are your employees, what are your team saying that you might not want them to say? Right. Are they accurately re- representing your brand? When I dug in the first time and I dig in like every three to six months, I am the guy who's occasional, but like my my head of sales is like on it all the time. Yeah, uh, I'm like, why are we saying it this way? And and I'm like, let me tell you this tidbit that like maybe you know here's a story that might help. Anyways, my point is, what are, what's your team saying that maybe you should know about, right? So if you don't know, it's not going to be any better tomorrow and whatever. If you don't know, you can't improve it. So that's that. But software and buying conversational intelligence software or any real software is like buying a gym membership. It only is valuable if you show up to the gym. In the beginning, showing up to the gym is just showing up, logging into the software, listening to calls. Well, as you get better, it's setting up filters. Like I think we're more like intermediate to advanced, right? Like it's like doing the right workouts, but in the beginning, it's just showing up. But definitely a gym membership without showing up is just wasted money. And that the problem is like the whole world is like brainwashed to think if I just buy this software, buy this thing, I will get the result I'm seeking. No, I think the question is how do I get what result I'm seeking? So for us, uh, I was like, how do we improve our close rate? How do we decrease our no show rate? Mm. And and then how do we decrease our activation churn? And those are the three problems I was trying to solve. So let me go back to 2018. Our head of sales, Luis, sent 
came to me and he's like, Susan, there's this awesome new tool and there's like five companies out there, Gong, Chorus, blah, 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 right? We got to buy this. It is going to change how we do sales. Like verbatim what he said to me, right? I'm like, how is it going to change the way we do sales? And he's like, something, right? And I'm like, and I, I and I actually asked him, I was like, hey, so um, when's the last time you listened to a, our sales team's calls? And he's like, well, like, you know, I don't have time on to do, to uh, to listen to all the recordings. And I'm like, but when's the last time? And he's like, when they first started, like the first 90 days, right? And only when there's problems. And I'm like, so have you tried listening to them on 3X? Yeah. And then skimming through the various people. And I'm like, before we go, and then I was like, go get bids from all these companies. And the bids were between like 10000 to $50,000 a year, right? And I'm like, okay, so like, hey, and I'll just be transparent. This is a while ago. He's like, I'm like, you're paid 200K yeah. OTE. So like, if you spent 25% of your time on this, it's cheaper than buying the software. Yeah. So go spend one day a week Yeah. and tell me when you've got all the low hanging fruit figured out and when you're just so... So anyways, long story short, he did this for two months. And I'm like, now we're ready to buy conversational intelligence software because you've done the homework. That's what I mean. So like, again, you know, go to the gym. Eventually you're like, I think I'll benefit from going to getting a personal trainer because I don't know what I'm doing. Conversation intelligence to me and just in general technology to me is show up, do the work, do it old school and ghetto and spreadsheets and simple. Then when you're at the point of like, I, I got it, go hire software. It's like if you're a found, if you're doing founder led sales and you hire three reps, but you haven't figured out the pitch, all you have is three more reps, not helping you figure out the pitch, testing out broken pitches, right? So, you know, we just hired a head of sales and I'm like, he's like, before I hire anybody else, I'm going to go do this, sell it, see what works, why it doesn't, what doesn't work, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm going to go hire people. Everyone, last five, 10, human nature, let me just go buy this, buy that. You know, again, you could send a million emails a month with the wrong pitch and get mediocre results or... You can go figure out the pitch, send 10,000 emails and have, you know, a, pi a long pipeline to go after as a million. I love this analogy. Heard it for the first time. I mean, obviously the gym membership subscription and the SaaS subscription definitely makes sense. I was just having a conversation with a friend of mine recently. He exactly said that, oh, this time of the December last year, I bought the subscription. It not go well. It's, does, does it still happen? Like, don't we know that you don't buy gym membership because... At the end of the year or at the beginning of the year, because we don't go. This is just the... Yeah, it's a, the tribulation. Exactly. Q1 um, at the gym is my favorite uh, favorite time because I get to see a lot of drop-off. But then there's like this one or one or 5% of people that like just stick it out, stick really? through it. And they're like, six months later, they're like, whoa, I don't recognize them. Anyways, this is be, crazy. my point is, if you want to succeed in the modern market and the competitive market, be the 1% to 5% that sticks to it, right? Cons at the end of the day, consistency is really the key. So we talked about, uh, yeah, maybe Jim is like a little too simple of an analogy, but at the end of the day, consistently training your reps no. is important, consistently learning. Mm -hmm. Life, the market and the world is evolving too fast for you to be asleep at the wheel and pitching like a canned approach. So, when I said your sales reps need to be experts, the reason they need to be experts is that they, the learning is just baked in. Yeah. I I loved it. Let's probably end it at this beautiful statement that consistency is key. Continuous learning is key. The growth mindset and getting better, be an expert to be a consultant for our buyers is the right modern way of selling, modern way of building SaaS company and growing the SaaS company efficiently in this economy as well. Sujan, thank you very much for everything, all the advice, great stories that you have shared, uh, great analogies that you have shared. Uh, hope the audience, you loved it. And uh, follow us on YouTube and any other podcast app that you're listening to in. And uh, don't forget to give us a like and more stars as well so that more people can find. And if there are any similar topics that you want me to dig in, we are going to continue to invite more guests. I have some amazing guests in the pipeline as well. So do comment and let us know. We would always love to hear from you as well. Bye-bye.
Oh, 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 oh,